passages from our writings. And the first verse is found in the book of Job, chapter 5, verse 19, and a combination of the New King James Version and the traditional, historic King James Version. James 5, Job 5, 19, the Lord, the Lord will deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven, no evil will touch thee. From the writings, God can solve the most difficult problems for those who believe in him. That's so good, that sentence. Maybe I should read it again. God can solve the most difficult problems for those who believe in him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, and removing the negative aspect and giving a positive. For we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses and who was in all points tempted like as we are. From the writings again, we, ne we need never feel that we are alone. Angels are our companions. The Holy Spirit abides with us. If in our ignorance we make missteps, the Savior does not forsake us. In the ways of the holy city, there is no difficulty that those who trust in God may not overcome. There is not a sorrow, not a grievance, not a human weakness for which God has not provided a remedy. Whatever the difficulties we labor under that weigh down the soul and the body, he wants to set us free. Not only does Jesus know every soul and the individual needs and charges of that soul, but he knows all the circumstances that chafe and perplex the spirit. He desires us to lay our perplexities and our troubles at his feet and leave them there. And back to the Bible again. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And surely as time goes by, I think difficulties for all are going to increase. And certainly those of us who are in older years, we are finding this as well. And you might remember that when Abraham was commanded by God to offer as a sacrifice his son, he was a gentleman of well-advanced years at that time. We must expect that difficulties will come and tests will occur. But we move back now to the closure of probation in the last days. Great Controversy 613, a book that you can still get at the ABC, but maybe later on you won't be able to obtain it that way quite so easily. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have accomplished their work, they have received the latter rain, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received, received the seal of the living God. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice declares, it is done. Do you remember when planet Earth was first created? Well, you weren't there, but you read about it. And when it was finished, God declares it is finished. It was good. When he was upon the cross, it is finished. And now at the close of probation, it is finished. It is done. It's closed. It's all over. Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins, yours, mine, everybody else's who is going to eternity. The number of his subjects is made up. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. So three episodes, three items of information thus far in this summary. The wedding on the hillside, an affirmation of faith facing the problems of life, and the close of probation in the last days. 
Our topic for the day, as the nicely printed bulletin states, the wedding on the hillside or the close of probation in the last days. Let us do what the elder did a little while ago. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. And in uh, my version, and perhaps in many of your versions, the words of Jesus are printed in red. And you'll note that Matthew 25 is simply a continuation of Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 is signs of the end. Matthew 25 now tells us more about the events of the end and particularly this parable. Matthew 25 verse 1, the kingdom of heaven should be likened to ten virgins. Jesus was there seated with four disciples upon the Mount of Olives. We've been there, we've seen it. But 2,000 years ago when Jesus was there, there was actually a dwelling a small house, probably one constructed from local stone, and uh, this small home, probably only one room, in the sort of hill uh, center of the downward slope of the Mount of Olives. This is the location. Jesus was there, and at the time when he was speaking, there was a wedding in preparation. And the more that you read the parables of our Lord, the uh, story that, uh, of Christ's object lessons as it is given in our writings or in the Holy Scriptures. The more you read these parables, the more you study them, the more you realize that Jesus was choosing actual events that were known to the people or they could see for themselves or they knew about. So that these sermon illustrations, these parables, were actual reality events in the lives of the people back then. And so here is this well-lit, single-roomed home uh, where obviously with the way the people are dressed and the way they are acting, they are waiting for a wedding procession. There are three locations in this parable. There is the location where the bridegroom lived, where he begins his procession. There is the home on the downward slopes of the Mount of Olives, where the wedding on the hillside, uh, part of the events are taking place. That is right there on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And then there is the ceremony and the uh, wedding uh, festival taking place in a home in the city of Jerusalem. This is the middle one. And so the uh, bride is there. The bridegroom is coming with his procession. And there are 10 bridesmaids right here on the slope, dressed in white, and they each have a lantern, a lamp. And the reason for that is because they're going to make a procession in the hours of darkness from there, down the slopes, across the valley of the Kedron, up into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus said five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. We know the story. The foolish took their lamps, but they didn't take any extra oil. But the wise took the, uh, their lamps, and they had a flagon, a small uh, bottle of extra oil. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps, made sure that they were burning nicely. And the foolish said to the wise, listen, can you give us some extra oil? Our oil is getting low. But the wise said, no, we're sorry. We've only got enough for ourselves. You better go into the city and buy from an oil dealer there so that you have enough. And so these uh, five went down the valley of the Kedron, across into Jerusalem with the intent of buying some oil from an oil seller. I don't know how they would expect to get any at midnight, but anyway, that's what happened. Now, while they were away, the bridegroom came, verse 10, and uh, those who were ready went in with him to the marriage, to this location in the city, and the door was shut. And afterwards, Jesus said, this is a parable, this is the story. And uh, he said, verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know not the, the, the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Now, specifically, yes, referring to the second coming, but specifically also inferring the close of probation before the Lord returns to planet Earth. <clears throat> I read 
from Christ's object lessons, the uh, parable is spelled out uh, and, and the page number is about 400 onwards. So uh, sometime you might want to read that because it's very interesting. And this is what it says here. In the parable, <coughs> all ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Jesus' second coming. Now that's something to ponder about because here you have ten who are expecting that the Lord will return in the clouds of heaven. But there's a delay, things don't go as expected and the signs take place and then the events of the build-up to the second coming seem to be a little bit different from what has been traditionally accepted. I might add that every event will be fulfilled according to the prophecies that are given. It's just that we have built up in our minds what we think is going to take place. Some things might be right in our mind, but other things are inaccurate. Read the scriptures. Read the spirit of prophecy. Make sure you know and understand. So with the church that lives just before Jesus' second coming. Percentage-wise, there are about 45 people here. Does that mean 22, 23 are going to be on the wrong side of the fence? Does it mean that 23 are going to be standing on the left foot when they should be standing on the right foot, not ready for the return of our Lord? I suppose it doesn't necessarily mean that way in every congregation. And I would certainly hope that that does not mean that thing in our church, your church here at Irvington. But I guess percentage-wise, right across the world, this is approximately the way that it work out. Now, notice this. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and lives another thing. You understand the meaning, don't you? And so in other words, these ten that are pictured here, they are not hypocrites. They attended church. Maybe they didn't attend Sabbath school so much, but they attended church, took part in the meetings. So what's wrong? What is, what is the problem? The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. The class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. So what is the answer? We have to be sure that we know what the scriptures tell us. We have to be sure that we know what the spirit of prophecy is telling us. We have to know what the signs of the times are, what the events are in the world, what we are expected to do in all of these circumstances. So being superficial in your Christian experience, according to this information here, is insufficient for you to get through the events of the time of the end. I read on. The great final test comes at the close of probation. What happens after the close of probation in the last days? Well, we'll come to that soon. God calls, and this is a part of the answer, God calls for our cheerful countenance, our hopeful words, our kindly hand clasp. Now, let's go back in history 6,000 years ago. Some of this was mentioned in the Sabbath school lesson and it's certainly appropriate for us today. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat of it. Two trees, tree of life, tree of death. Eat from the tree of life, avoid the tree of death. This is what God the Father and uh, Michael the archangel told our earliest parents, for by whom we are all related in the events of life. Story of Redemption 47. Probation would be granted to Adam in which through a life of repentance and faith in the atonement of the Son of God, 
he might be redeemed from his transgression of the Father's law. There are ten commandments, well, ten bridesmaids too. That's sort of interesting, isn't it? But ten commandments and every trans, uh, transgression of the law breaks one of these commandments, primarily, but certainly others in a secondary um, application. And uh, what is it if you take something that you've been told not to take? I guess the, the commandment that says very briefly, thou shalt not steal, would be the primary applica application of that commandment. Others as well, thou shalt not covet, uh, and so forth, would be broken in a secondary application. Now, the Messiah, the active creator, who became the active redeemer, has garnered the things of faith and applied them and granted them to us. Hebrews 4.15, Jesus, he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. And sometimes I can ask people, is there anybody here who has lived a perfect life? You've heard me say that before. And there is none. Well, there were three people on planet Earth who have lived a perfect life. One was Jesus as the Messiah, and the other two were Adam and Eve before they committed sin, but certainly not after. All right. Now, this is surprising information. I am reading about the ministry of Jesus. For a period of time, Jesus was on probation. He took humanity upon himself to stand the test and the trial which the first Adam failed to endure. If Jesus had failed this test, he would have been disobedient to the voice of God and the world would have been lost. We, you and I would never have been invented. It would have been over. John 17, 4, in the New King James Version, it's the prayer of Jesus walking down the slopes of the Kedron Valley across to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says as he is walking in this prayer, Father, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And so the Lord was obedient in all things, all the way throughout these things. And as a result of the ministry of Jesus in the plan of salvation, this is gifted to the human race. You and I have done nothing to earn salvation, and it's totally impossible to even try and be successful. It is a gift of God to the human race in what is called the second probation. Adam and Eve failed the first probation, they were given a second probation. Jesus gave his life that man should have another trial. He did not die on the cross to abolish the law, the Ten Commandments, but to secure for man a second probation. And I'll read on. Probation is granted to all, that all may form characters for eternal life. Now, okay, if we fail to accept the ministry of Jesus and the plan of salvation, or if we only do it half-heartedly and our eyes are closed, is there an opportunity for a second probation for us? I read on. Christ's object lessons in dealing with this information. Christ desires his hearers to understand that it is impossible for men... I might also add women, young people, boys and girls. Christ desires his hearers to understand that it is impossible for men to secure salvation of the soul after death. Well, we knew that, but this is the emphasis of it. There is no such place as purgatory where somebody can be um, brought out by good deeds of somebody here in the world. It just doesn't exist. When the eyes are closed, it is over for that individual. Now, now is probationary time. There is not another probation for anyone. So when does probation close? All right. You will remember that in the sequence of information and events, we looked at the story of the ten plagues of ancient Egypt. 
there were the three first plagues of ancient Egypt. Then there was a separation between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Who are the Egyptians and who are the Hebrews here? But I guess it doesn't really matter. You're all belonging to the Lord. So there were three first plagues, a separation between the two races because one race was serving the Lord, even if sometimes it was not uh, so effectively, but at least they were um, in among the Lord's people. Then there were the seven last plagues of ancient Egypt. How does that affect the last day? Well, as we've mentioned, there are the first three plagues, Matthew 24, uh, verse uh, 7, I think, where it speaks about famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. After that, there is the close of probation, and then the seven last plagues of the last days. And what we're talking about now is the close of probation before the seven last plagues actually begin. And so this is the way that it is given. Daniel chapter 11, verses 45 and chapter 12, verse 1. Remove the chapter break. Just read it as one particular uh, sequence. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And at that time, when he will plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, what is that? We're not exactly sure. But I just wonder whether it might be that the Vatican might move, to, might move to Jerusalem one day. That is a possibility. He will plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the, uh, in the glorious holy mountain. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. He stands up, it is finished, it is over, it's gone. It's completed. Revelation says the same thing. For chapter 22, the last chapter, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So this is the declaration. It's at an unstated time. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The thief does not announce the time when he's coming, for his incursion. So the day of the Lord, the close of probation will occur when human beings are not aware of it. Silently, unnoticed as the midnight thief, will come the decisive hour that marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercy's offer to guilty men. God has not revealed to us the time when probation will have an end. When probation ends, it will come suddenly, unexpectedly. So, okay, then we, as time moves on, we can think of a time that when it would be unexpected, when it would be um, sudden, and set that as a suggestion of when it will come. We still will not get it right. It will come at a time when we are least expecting it. Come when it may. The day of God will come unawares to the ungodly. Now, here is a difference because God's people become aware of these circumstances and these events. And so this will not catch you who know the scriptures, you who know the writings that we've got. You will understand what is taking place. So when the irrevocable decision has been pronounced, and the destiny of the world has been forever fixed, the inhabitants of the world will know it not. Now, that is an unstated time. But we do know that it will come after the Sunday laws are enacted. Seven Bible commentary, mentioned in Revelation also. The image of the beast will be formed before, the probation, before probation closes. The living righteous will receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. So the Sunday laws will take place. But don't wait until that time to learn and understand what is given in the writings. Now is the time of preparation for these things. It's after the latter rain. Great Controversy 6.11. Servants of God will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. When things get really serious, 
God's people will certainly be active, going to friends and relatives and family and workmates and strangers and telling them, look, it's coming to an end. You better get ready. Servants of God will hasten. It doesn't say from house to house, which is sometimes what people say in this quotation, but it's not correct. Servants of God will hasten from place to place, going to the people that they know to proclaim this message. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. And what I have read before, Jesus will not leave the most holy place until every case is decided, either for salvation or for destruction. Can you picture that? The eternal divinity is up there in heaven with every machinery activated for the second coming. All of the angels, everything is in place. And Jesus is there working on the plan of salvation and preparation for the second coming. And he is waiting until everybody on planet Earth, including the final last person, to make a decision for or against. I wonder who it would be that would hold up the second coming until they are ready and coming for that event. God is love. And he will not come until everybody has made their decision. Let me read that again. Earlier writings 36. Jesus will not leave the most holy place until every case is decided, either for salvation or for destruction. Now there will be a famine in the last days. Amos chapter 8 verse 11. Do you remember that? Let me ask you a question. In this context, what is that famine in the last days? Can you tell me? Can you say that aloud? Yes. I heard somebody else say something else. Yeah, the Word of God. Okay, that's almost correct. When you read Amos chapter 8, and uh, let me see, um, verse... Where I'm, yeah, here we are, chapter 8, verse 12, uh, verse 11. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, famine of food, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. It is not a famine for the word of God. It is a famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. Now, what's the difference? There are people who can read the Bible, study it uh, academically, get, even get a doctorate in it, but they don't have a Christian experience. It's a knowledge thing. The Holy Spirit applies the content of the Holy Scriptures to the heart and to the life. Is that correct? Now, if God is withdrawing the Holy Spirit... If salvation is over at the close of probation, there is no Holy Spirit for the wicked. And if there is no Holy Spirit for the wicked, it's all over. How can they understand the Bible? They can't build it into their life. So this is not a, uh, a statement that the Bible will no longer be available. I mean, as we are aware, the Gideons are providing, what is it, a million Bibles a month. To, uh, in various languages upon planet Earth. And there are numerous organizations around the world. It would be totally impossible in a hundred years for every Bible to be destroyed upon planet Earth. That's not what it is saying. The Bible is still there, but it has become a history book, no longer the Word of God applied to the heart, to the soul, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's confirmed in the same passage of uh, information in Christ's Object Lessons about the hillside wedding. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. That's exactly what the writings tell us. Verse 12, they will wander from sea to sea. That sounds like your national anthem, doesn't it? They will wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east, from the papacy to God's people. They will run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. They will not find it because the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn, at least from the wicked. The Holy Spirit will never be withdrawn from God's people. 
You need the Holy Spirit all the way through. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. They will wander to and fro, even to the east. They will run to and fro to seek the Word of the Lord and will not find it. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. There is a warning. SDG 343. The time is coming when it will be too late to seek God. That is no concern from your point of view because you're in the right direction. Jeremiah 8.20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved, some will declare. Last day events 2.35, the ministers of God will have done their last work, offered their last prayers, shed their last bitter tear for, these are not my words, I am reading, shed their last bitter tear for a rebellious church and an ungodly people. Where does that place Adventists? For a rebellious church. That's hardly what we like to think of ourselves, isn't it? It's not that way, not that way. The ministers of God, those who are preaching the word of God, preaching the end of all things, not the um, happy events on television, not the prosperity gospel, but actually giving the work uh, the word of God in its uh, true uh, context. The ministers of God will have done their last work, offered their last prayers, shed their last bitter tear for a rebellious church and an ungodly people. I read on. Preparation. Those who do not now appreciate, study, and dearly prize the word of God spoken by his servants will have cause to mourn bitterly hereafter. You have an appointed pastor here. Years ago, that was our privilege. We appreciate invitations to visit. And of course, we hold our membership here. Those who do not now appreciate, study, and dearly prize the word of God, spoken by his servants. Your pastor preaches the word. Take note of what he says. Well, you do anyway. And you know, as we, my wife and I, are visiting various churches and speaking, I, this is what I state to all the churches that I visit, not only here in Irvington. Listen to what your pastor tells you. Make his life easy. Love and appreciate your pastor's wife. This is something that is important in the ways of salvation. Then I read on. All, everybody, will be tested and tried according to the light that we have had. Those who turn from the, tr the truth to fables can look for no second probation. Great Controversy 620 in last day of end information says, those who delay, delay a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble, nor at any subsequent time. The case of all such is hopeless. We're not in that stage yet. We're not in the panic stage yet. And even if, even if we were in the panic stage in the history of planet Earth, James chapter 5 tells us don't panic but retain a confirmed faith. This is the situation. So we come to the end of the information that is being presented this way. You, you had the ten plagues of Egypt, the first three plagues of ancient Egypt, a difference, and the seven last plagues of ancient Egypt. You have the ten plagues of the last days, the three first plagues of the last days, close of probation in the last days, and ultimately the seven last plagues. Other topics that are coming. Update on Armageddon. The truth about the Sunday laws, and they're coming up on the horizon sometime, we're sure. But maybe, unless there is some tremendous world event that intervenes between now and the next time that we are due to visit here, this congregation, maybe we'll just interrupt the flow of last day of information and we'll present the story about the, and the truth about Mary Magdalene. There are some strange things, strange stories that are being uh, told today in the news media about Mary Magdalene. What are the actual facts about her life, her experience, and her involvement? But I close by reading a statement I have read before. Great Controversy 634. Glorious will be the deliverance of those who have patiently waited for his coming 
and whose names are written in the book of life. We can all say amen to that. We sang earlier, 152, tell me the story of Jesus. We sing now, 511, I know whom I have believed. Words quoted from Holy Scripture, but an affirmation of individual personal experience. I know whom I have believed. Number 511.